An important factor in the practice is respect. There's a passage where the Buddha says that if you lack respect and deference, then you lack a whole set of other qualities that are necessary for the path. So what do you have to respect? I mean, traditionally, you respect the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. What does that mean? It means that you respect the human ability to do good. And not only to do good, but through human action we can put an end to suffering. And that's something we should find inspiring. If you look at the news these days, human behavior is not all that inspiring. But of course it depends on where you look. It's good to think about the examples that you do find inspiring. Think about a John Munn, coming from a peasant background, coming from the Northeast. And the Thailand, Northeastern Thailand was really out in the boonies. The people there were considered to have no real hope of making any kind of advancement. Yet he didn't let that get him down. Just because he was born a peasant didn't mean that he couldn't find awakening. That was his attitude. And he did what it, whatever was needed. It was not an easy path. He ran against a lot of resistance outside and inside. But he was able to do it. You think about Abbas Kiki again. Here she was a woman. People were looking down on the possibility or the potential that women would have to practice. She didn't let that get her down. She found a place, a quiet place, an old abandoned monastery. It was just her and her aunt and her uncle. They created a place to, to practice, and gradually people were attracted. And a lot of it had to do with her own honesty in detecting her defilements. And so they got more and more refined. So think about the people who you find inspiring. Feed your mind there. And then look at yourself. Although there are times when it seems like you have a lot of weaknesses and the practice is very daunting. Remember that the people who've succeeded started out with weaknesses as well. There is a tendency in some biographies to make it sound like they were destined. They go far in the practice, but again, it was a struggle. And yet they were able to find the resources within, within themselves. You have to tell yourself, they can do it, I can do it. Now putting yourself on their level doesn't mean that you lack respect for them. What you're trying to do is lift the level of your mind. There's that passage in the definition of right effort, usually translated as upholding your intent, but it also can be translated as lifting up your mind. Think about the things that you find uplifting. Raise your sights. It is possible for human beings to put an end to suffering. That's what it means to have respect for the Buddha. Respect for the Dharma, of course, means that there are things you've got to do. He laid down the law. Not that he created the law, but he found what needed to be done, the Buddha. And he set it out. And he didn't set it out for us to say, well, I don't like this, I'm going to replace it with that. Or now that we're living in the 21st century in America, we need a more streamlined Dharma or an easier Dharma or a Dharma that's more in line with what we want. 
After all, what has changed in the human, human mind? Is greed any different from what it was back then? Is anger any different? Delusion? The problems are all the same. The solutions have to be the same. There may be some minor details, what things we're greedy about. But when you get down to the real problem, it's not so much the things, it's the mind's tendency to like greed, to like anger, to like delusion. And the objects are only secondary. So the primary issues are all the same. This is why John Mun's principle was practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. This is the Buddha's principle. He said that's how you show real respect to him. Respect for the Sangha means realizing that there have been people who have followed the Buddhist instructions, practiced in line with them, and gotten good results. And they've carried the tradition down to us. So this Western tendency we have to set ourselves up and look down on things is something we have to learn how to cure. We have to realize that, like every human being, we're in a position where our defilements can be really strong. And we need whatever examples we can to lift our minds. So we can fight against our own defilements. And that does require lifting the mind up to the level that people have practiced. And if that's your attitude, then you're more likely to learn from the tradition and give it a good hearing. Because it's only when you see your own mistakes, see how you're creating unnecessary suffering for yourself, that you're going to be open to other people's advice. If you think that everything you do is perfectly fine or good enough, you've closed the door. You have to keep reminding yourself you could be better. And you want to learn how to live with that possibility in a useful way. In a way that does actually, actually make you better than you have been. As some people find when they work with a goal that it makes them tense and frustrated. And that's simply a sign that you have to learn to work with goals in a different way. Remember that part of the goal we're after here is true happiness. And the word for happiness, sukha, can also be translated as pleasure, bliss, ease, well-being. So ask yourself, what kind of breathing right now would lead to bliss? What kind of ways of thinking would lead to bliss that would be lasting. And we're not just here to relax and to think about, well, whatever puts my mind at ease is, is the Dharma. There's the ease that goes nowhere, and there's the ease that goes someplace. You really have to make the distinction. The ease of a mind that comes into concentration, that goes someplace. The ease of a mind that decides, I simply want to relax and take it easy, that goes nowhere, or it slides down. It's like that hill near Mount Lassen. It's composed of little bits of, of lava. You start climbing up the hill, and you realize that if you stand still, wait and stop, stop at some point and stand still, you're sliding down the hill. So if you just stand still and say, well, I'm going to go for whatever puts my mind at ease, you're sliding down the hill. You have to find the ease that pulls you up, or gives the possibility of going up. So it's important to make that distinction. 
because that's something else you have to respect in the Dharma, is the principle of causality. Our actions don't just have immediate results in the present moment, they also have long-term results. You have to respect that. This is why it is necessary at times to sacrifice immediate pleasures, pleasures for the sake of long-term well-being. But fortunately, the whole path is not one of sacrifice. You find that there are pleasures that, at the very least, have no harm, cause no harm. But there are other pleasures that actually are helpful on the path. The formula for the jhanas. Pleasure and rapture born of seclusion. Sometimes that's translated as accompanied by pleasure and rapture, but the word accompanied by is not there in the Pali formula. Pleasure and rapture born of seclusion, accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. The pleasure and the rapture are the things that you really get absorbed in. You have to hold on to the breath as your main object, but the absorption comes with a sense of rapture and well-being. That's integral to the concentration. And it's in getting the mind concentrated that way that you can see things a lot more clearly. You, you can't do concentration, you can't get the mind into jhana without some insight into how the mind fabricates things. And as the mind settles down, then it can see things more clearly, allowing you to settle down more deeply, more profoundly, and then see things more clearly again. That kind of pleasure, that kind of rapture actually goes someplace. That kind of ease goes someplace. But it is accompanied by the realization there is more to be done. That too you have to respect. So respecting the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha lifts the mind, because it lifts our sights as to what's possible. and should give rise to a desire. Other people can do this. They say it's really good. That's something I want. That desire, too, is something to respect. It's the one place in the canon where the word craving is used in a positive sense, that craving for the awakening is to be encouraged, is to be respected. So feed the mind with good examples, that examples that lift your sense of what human beings can do, what you as a human being can do, and they give you the encouragement and the strength and the nourishment to keep on practicing in that direction. <laughs>